Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Stephen George, and this is Dr. Thomas Errico, and we're pediatric spinal surgeons at Nicholas Children's Hospital. Thank you for joining us this morning for this YouTube live series. Uh, we'd like to give you a little bit of information about what we do and some of the misconceptions of uh, the conditions we treat. Uh, we'd like this to be sort of informal. Um, we'll have a question session at the end, so if you have any questions, please uh, put it on the, uh, in the chat box there and we'll get to it at the end. Uh, but I hope this is uh, informative to you and helpful to you and I hope you participate. Thank you very much. Stephen, good morning. I, I just wanted to share something with the audience that uh, I, I note from my years of seeing patients in the office. I, I often see patients coming to us with their children from the pediatrician and they're kind of worried. They've heard this word scoliosis. They may or may not know what it means. And uh, I, I just want to sort of allay some of your fears. A scoliosis is, is not a disease uh, in, in itself. It, it's, it's just sort of a sign that something's going on uh, with your child's spine. Next slide. So let's think about what is a disease? Well, a disease is, is a sickness or a malady, and it's usually uh, presents with some signs and symptoms. For example, if you had a if you had the flu, you may tell someone, I, I feel hot. That's a that's a symptom, that's subjective. But if we take your temperature and it's 102, well that's a sign. So a sign is is kind of an objective evidence of that there's something wrong with you. And and it, but a sign could be uh, span many multiple uh, different diseases. Uh, a sign is not, often not unique to just one disease process. So I, I'm, I'm in the, uh, my office and, and the child is there. They're usually not too concerned, but the parents are, are very worried because they've heard this word scoliosis and, and basically it, it scares them. So what is uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis? Well, in its simplest form, it's just a lateral curvature of the spine. When you look at someone's spine from either the front or the back, it's usually straight. But if you get a lateral curve like that, we call that scoliosis. <coughs> and the word idiopathic in medicine, it just means that we don't know exactly why this has happened. So it's kind of we're ignorant of the exact cause. I think that's the safest way to uh, say that. So scoliosis w is not idiopathic or it's not unknown. Uh, in, in a lot of true diseases, there, there are, are children uh, uh, that will present with some type of neuromuscular disease. I'm, I'm going to mention some scary words uh, like cerebral pal palsy or sometimes a child's bones don't form together. They're, they're fused in, in an awkward position. We call that congenital scoliosis. There's, there's just a, a, a lot of different things that, that are true diseases and scoliosis is a sign in these diseases. It's a manifestation that one of these diseases is present. Now, some of these are, are uh, they're different types of diseases, and I'm just going to collectively uh, put them in a simplistic way. Some people have diseases, uh, congenital uh, diseases and uh, uh, genetic diseases that are a problem with the soft tissues, the discs, the ligaments, the tendons in your spine. And some kids have uh, a, a disease where the bone is a problem. And others have problems with their neuromuscular control, either the muscles themselves or the nerves that control uh, the, uh, the, the spine. So scoliosis in these true diseases is a sign. Now, in, in idiopathic scoliosis with these healthy young children, scoliosis <coughs> is just a sign that there's some deviation from normal, not a true disease, but an abnormality of either the soft tissues, the bone, or perhaps the neuromuscular uh, controlling factors as the spine is growing. So these healthy children, they don't have a disease, and they show up with an asymmetry of their spine in the pediatrician's office. They send it over to us for us to check it, and, and it's just a sign of something unknown in their genes that
that gives them a, a slight deviation of either their soft tissues, their bones, uh, or, or the neuromuscular elements, or perhaps a slight variation in all three of them. So you could easily ask yourself, why does the spine ever grow straight? There's so much that has to happen for it to go straight. Well, the vast majority of people are on the spectrum or the, on the range that their repair processes and their strength of their bones, of their soft tissues, of their neuromuscular structures is just completely normal. But if you have any deviation of that, the spine might grow crooked. Then there's a, and, and when scientists try and figure out well, why this happens, they're, they're constantly befuddled because the, uh, the, these genetic processes that occur uh, are, are so multifactorial. There's so many genes uh, on every chromosome in, in your body that it, it, there's just li literally thousands and thousands of variations to your genes that could cause these. And, and the literature is just replete with, you know, in, in Norwegians, you have this type of problem that causes scoliosis. And then in Chinese people, you have this problem. So it's, it's just too complicated to just nail down to one simple thing. But in the most simplistic way of thinking about a child who does not have a disease, but has this sign of a lateral curvature, you think if your child is completely normal, they're on that top bar. Their, their genes are completely normal. Uh, and if they have some slight tendency in their genes to some uh, fatigue factor, one of those three things, soft tissue, uh, either the bones uh, or the, uh, the uh, neuromuscular elements, the muscles or the nerves, they may have a mild scoliosis. If it's something a little more severe, they may have a significant scoliosis. But it is not the scoliosis that we see in genetic uh, diseases, and it's not really a, a, a scoliosis. So think of a child with scoliosis as having a mild variance of normal, and it's something related to their soft tissues, or something related to their bones, or something related to the nerves or their muscles. S Stephen, do you see parents sort of being alarmed by this diagnosis? <laughs> uh, all the time. And one of the first things that I try to emphasize and repeat is that um, something very similar to what you're saying, that this is more of a sign. And um, the treatments that we have now are so good that it's something that they should just set their mind at ease and just, we will figure out exactly what's best for them at that time, at that stage. Um, and this is something you go on with life. I mean, it, it really shouldn't hold them back at all. Listen, the worst thing a doctor can tell a patient is you have a, something wrong with you and there's nothing we can do. In this particular entity, we have lots of things that we can do. We can make this go away. Absolutely. So maybe you could take us through some of the history of how we yeah. got to where we are today. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, so again, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we treat this sign. Because again, in scoliosis, the sign is this spinal deformity. Okay, uh, when we think about idiopathic scoliosis, um, as Tom mentioned, it's this side to side uh, bending of the spine. But when we delve a little bit deeper and why we get that, it's actually the building block of the spine that's a little bit abnormal. If you see in this slide here, a normal vertebra, the building block of the spine, is actually a squared, but in the idiopathic scoliosis patient, that actually has more of an angle, you see. It's uh, what we call lordosed, bending backwards. And that one factor right there uh, causes quite a bit of deformity. And, and uh, it's a concept that we call coupled motion. And that's a, that, what that basically describes is that small deformity leads to a deformity in three different planes. The plane when you look at somebody straight on, when you look at them from the side, and actually when you look at them from the top down, okay? And so that's why we call scoliosis or idiopathic scoliosis a three-dimensional deformity. And understanding this is something that over the past few decades we've been um, gaining more and more information about. And our technology to do so has uh, also significantly improved. As I mentioned before, this three-dimensional deformity you see uh, on, the on the slide here on the right, 
There's that side to side bending, which is not normal, but there's also a flattening of the spine when you look at them from the side. And then when you look at them from top down, which is sort of hard to imagine, but we can do this in our, with our imaging software, you see that the spine is also deviated in that plane as well. It's rotated. You know, here at uh, Nicholas Children's, we have, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough to have uh, an x-ray machine called the EOS machine that allows us to take x-rays on our patients using 90% less radiation. And again, just to go back to how important that is, it's something that we take very, very seriously. In these conditions, taking x-rays is sort of a fundamental process to understand uh, the, the deformity. Uh, however, uh, the ability to do that without exposing our kids to as much, radi uh, as much radiation is something that we're very, very fortunate to have here. Uh, this mach machine is also uh, able to create a three-dimensional picture of that spine, which helps us to understand the complexity of that deformity, and with that, helps us find the proper treatment for the patient. So, when we go to correct this sign, uh, one, of the, one of the first things we'd like to do is stop the progression of this deformity, of this sign. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons we treat this condition. It's because it is progressive and it gets worse over time. But the other thing that we uh, spend a lot of time and a lot of our focus on is restoring this harmonious uh, balance to the spine. Every spine is different. Every person is different and what's normal for them is also very different. So understanding the deformity and what that person's body really calls for is very, very important as we um, try to find the best uh, treatment for this condition. The other thing we really want to do is involve as little of the spine as we, as we can. Part of the procedure is to fuse part of the spine, and we want to fuse as little of it as we uh, need to. So here we have uh, an example of a patient who has uh, scoliosis, and as, as you can imagine, we have that left to right curve, but when you look at the side x-ray, you see that um, there is some deformity there as well, and when they bend to the left and to the right, we kind of get an idea of how flexible the curve is. Um, but understanding how to treat that um, is something that has evolved over the years. As we go back uh, for more of a historical perspective of how this was treated surgically, we look back into the, the 70s where, you know, when surgeons looked at this deformity or this sign, they said, well, let's just try to make it straighter. And they did so by basically distracting or lengthening the spine as much as they could to get that straight. Now, Unfortunately, they did this from the back, and because of the instrumentation that they had at the time, they weren't able to really control the deformity as, as much as they'd like. Um, and so what would end up happening is you would get some correction in that side-to-side uh, that side -to -side curve, but when you look at the spine from the, uh, from the side, and you see on the x-ray on the right there, they functionally made that spine straight in that plane. And that's not a normal position. That is not a natural position for the spine. So there were some limitations to that because they just did the instrumentation didn't allow them to do perhaps what they wanted to do. Now in the mid 80s and late 80s there was a hook uh, hook and rod construct using what we call segmental instrumentation where they tried to get a better control of the spine. Uh, yet they improved some of the deformity in the, in, in the frontal plane, but they still were not able to control some of the rotation of the spine, which we talked about, and some of the uh, deformity in the, in the lateral or the side view of the spine. A lot of this uh, comes down to the fact that the instrumentation or what they used to correct the spine at the time was not powerful enough, and it did not have enough hold on the spine to rotate and derotate and bend the, each building block, each vertebra in the way that they wanted to. And that's because they used this hook that you see on the left here that went under a certain part of the spine. Whereas the development of something called a pedicle screw, which we use now, involves the entire uh, vertebral body. And that gives us much better control over the spine and correcting these deformities, again, in a way that is more harmonious to each individual patient. 
As a result, this pedicle screw that we now use, and it has been used for um, decades now, is the gold standard. And it really allows us to control the deformity and correct it in a way uh, that is best for the patient. Again, here's that same patient. And here's what we did. And, and again, uh, we have two x-rays from the before and the after. And again, we look at the front view and we see how we were able to correct that front view, but also the side view, where it was flat before, we're able to now restore this harmonious curve that is natural uh, in the spine. You know, Tom, I want you to give me a little bit of your experience about when, uh, when we talk about this historical perspective and what it was like. Did you use any of those uh, earlier uh, systems, and what was your experience with that? Well, Stephen, I'm just a slightly bit older than you, <laughs> just a little bit, but I, I have to admit that uh, uh, in the early 1980s as a resident, I was trained in the Harrington Rod, and, and I've talked to patients that were had a Harrington Rod and then put in bed in a body cast for six months afterwards and then wore a body cast for another three to four months after that while uh, ambulating around. So uh, I have seen this, and, and the... The results today are just light years ahead of where we were even in the um, early 1980s, which is not that long ago. I want to remind you it's not that long ago. <laughs> but uh, the, it's, it's really amazing how quickly these young kids get back to normal activities. Uh, I, you know, I see some scary things on the Internet about, oh, my God, don't ever have your child fused. But, you know, in my experience, I've seen these kids get back to all types of sports, basketball, uh, gymnastics, uh, softball, uh, anything that they really want to do and go on to have perfectly normal lives. And if there's a comment about them having a few spine, it's usually, wow, they have really nice posture. Absolutely. No, I think um, to your point, that's, that's very well stated. I think when patients come in and we talk about what we do for their severe deformity, the first thing they want to know is, oh, what am I not going to be able to do, and how much is it going to hurt, and how long will I be out of everything for? And, and I think it comes as a surprise to both patients and families when they really um, start to understand what, the, what, what it's actually like. You know, in our, in our hands, you know, the patient's in the hospital after surgery for only about two to three days. You know, they're walking on the first day after surgery. They return to school, eh, two and a half weeks or so, uh, and they return to most activities at three months and they return to all activities with no limitations at six months. And I think when patients hear that, when parents hear that, um, it, it, their eyes open and they say, oh, I didn't realize that, it, it, that this was going to be the end result, and, and I'm very happy about that. I had kind of an eye-opening experience about 10 years ago. I had a family that was just petrified at the thought of this operation, and they were in for their third pre-op visit, and I spent almost an hour in the exam room answering all their questions. And uh, then we went out to the desk uh, and I brought them out and just by chance they saw one of my patients that was three weeks out from the surgery. And uh, I took one look at her and I said, oh wow, you look great. I said, how far out are you? She said, I'm three weeks. And I realized that my few hours of conversation meant nothing. But as soon as the parents saw how normal this child was three weeks after the operation. In awe, they said, she's three weeks out, let's just get this done. <laughs> yeah, so you know, that's a, that's a great point, and it's usually those testimonials that really bring things to life, and that's why you know, I always feel that the patients we care for sort of become part of our family, and when they do that, it, it just sort of expands this network. And I think the, uh, one of the best things for patients and families who have been just sort of diagnosed with this is to really talk to those other people in our family, those people we've cared for, because the words that come out of their mouths, uh, they listen to. <laughs> what we say, they only listen to sometimes. Well, you know, it, it's amazing how willing children and their families are to talk to another child before they've undergone this. Uh, it's, it's amazing that there's sort of a, an immediate bond between the two of them. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's very heartening to uh, just see how willing people are to sort of reach behind them and grab the hand of someone before they go through this and just help pull them through. It, it, it really speaks well for humanity. Absolutely, and I think um, 
This is one of the reasons why our patients always keep in touch with us and they tell us how they're doing and they like to continue that story because it doesn't start and end with the diagnosis and the treatment, but that follow-up and that relationship and that bond that's formed years and years after is something that is probably the most special. And you know, he, you know here are some of our patients that say, hey, you know, I want people to know that scoliosis didn't define me, it didn't change my life, and you know, from high level dancing to volleyball to skiing to swimming to skateboarding and acrobatics, they're all doing it. You know, and I think um, this is something that should be known and should be understood and people out there who are learning more about scoliosis should realize that. And we really thank our patients for being so willing to uh, tell their story and, and make this known. Uh, and it really does help the other people out there watching this for the first time. Or, uh, You know, I, and when I talk to a patient and I encourage them to speak to uh, one of the patients that's had this done, I, I, I frequently use this phrase. I said, listen, I've done this a thousand times or more, but I've never had it done to me even once. In order to really understand, you need to talk to a patient as well who's had it done once. And then you have the full spectrum of what you're getting involved with. Absolutely. And uh, we have a patient who, you know, voluntarily submitted a, a video here of, you know, her pre and post-op x-rays. And she was a very nervous patient and was very uh, fearful that after being treated for this, after having the surgery, that it would limit her passion. It would limit what she loved to do, which was dance. And at six months, she sent us this video um, and said, thank you. You know, I, this has really not been the experience that I thought. And um, this sort of typifies and really uh, emphasizes that. And here's a video that she sent, and she's back to dancing. And I thought it was just beautiful to see and such a um, great story for people to uh, uh, pay attention to and learn from. And, you know, a lot of times people talk about, oh, well, I, you know, fusions she, she, are always bad. She has great posture. Yes, she's great. I say fusions are always bad. It's, and, and, again, we're very cautious about when we fuse and what we fuse. But we always say that a fusion doesn't always limit your motion. I mean, in regards to returning to what you want to do and having all your functional motion. And I think we could both agree that she has good functional motion. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, sometimes we look at these long x-rays and uh, the, the thoracic component of a, lo a lot of these uh, fusions is an area of your spine that doesn't move very much. The rib cage uh, really limit thoracic movement. So uh, when we get a really limber person and they can bend over and touch their toes, uh, which I can't do anymore by the way, but uh, if I could still do it, there'd be about 135 degrees of motion there. And 90 of that comes from the hips, it doesn't even come from the spine. And the vast majority of that remaining motion comes from the lower few levels in the spine, which we endeavor very hard to stay away from. And uh, by doing that, uh, people return to uh, just very functional movement. And in, in many respects, their spine is stronger, more resistant to injury, and they have less aches and pains that other people do when they get older. Absolutely. You know, I, I really want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I hope you guys uh, have some questions for us. I wanted to, you know, tell you guys how you can find us, where we're located. Um, we're in several locations in West Kendall, Pinecrest, Aventura, Palm Beach Gardens, Miramar, Coconut Creek, and here at the main hospital. Uh, and if you're, if you're trying to contact us, you can email us at orthokids at nicholashealth.org and uh, set up an appointment. It's, it's not... Uh, un infrequent for us to get uh, emails. This is my child. Uh, this is the curve. I've been advised this. Uh, sh should I come see you? Or is everything fine with what I'm doing? Most of the time, uh, it's probably not necessary to make the trip. But uh, you know, this is something that we do uh, 24 uh, 7, 365 days a year. This is who we are. Uh, we are pediatric scoliosis surgeons and take care of all types of spinal deformities in kids. And uh, if you need us, we're here. Absolutely. So thank you, thank you very much. And again, we'll now look to see if there are any questions for us, um, and we'll answer those. Let's see here.
So, Stephen, I'm going to throw that ball back at you and ask you a question. Uh, you know, you asked me about those early Harrington rods, but um, how about some of those uh, dual rod and hook constructs? Uh, was that kind of before your time, or were you? No, and I, I think it's something that um, I, I am familiar with using and used in the past. But and and to really go at it and say that there is an indication for that. It's a, a technology that was great in the 80s and still has applications now, and we still use it for certain types of spinal deformities. In idiopathic scoliosis, uh, it tends not to uh, be needed as much because the pedicle screws are so powerful and allow us to do so much more. Um, but it's a, it's a great tool that we uh, always keep in our bag. Well, you know, at the, at, right on the cusp of when we were switching over from those hook and rod systems to the screws, uh, I had a, a straightforward case that could be done in either way and uh, the fellow I was working with that day expressed an interest in, in seeing the hook, hook and rod construct. I said, well listen, there's no medical reason why I couldn't use it. it the result will be the same. Let's get out the set. And uh, a, as I did that and went through the end, at the end of the case I said, wow, that was a struggle. Uh, it, it's so much easier. The patients bleed less. It goes faster. Uh, and that was the last case I did. Uh, sort of as a demonstration, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, there's, there's no doubt that the control we have over the spine now is so much better with these modern techniques. So, question for you, Tom, and that is, um, in the imaging that we're using now, and the way we're uh, able to uh, understand the spine and understand uh, true deformity and how it um, sort of plays off pelvic deformity and so on, how has that changed uh, your practice? Well, uh, I, I, have, I have to admit that uh, in another life, uh, I did an awful lot of adult uh, deformity surgery uh, when I was uh, working uh, in, in New York City. And uh, the EOS machine was clearly the, the defining factor that allows us to see from the side and the front, from the top, really from your skull down to your ankles, uh, how the whole body is aligned. And uh, adults uh, would come in with a lot of uh, sagittal balance problems. That's a confusing term. It means they were kind of pitched forward. They didn't stand up straight. It was, it was hard for them to stand up straight. And our experience with adults has been extrapolated to kids. And we now know better what position we need to leave these children in after a scoliosis operation so that 30, 40 years from now, when they're looking back on it, uh, they, they will have uh, less of the problems that many people have in their 40s and 50s even if they didn't have scoliosis mm -hmm, surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, uh, the EOS machine, uh, besides the fact that it's one-tenth, one-twentieth the dose radiation, I can, I can do someone's entire uh, career of x-rays uh, for less radiation than used to be getting one, that first x-ray in a doctor's office years ago. Yeah. So uh, it, it's been a game changer really. Absolutely, and I think um, that is part of the process when you're even talking about this surgery to patients and families. I get a lot of patients who come in and their mom or their dad have had the procedure in the past and they've had it in the 70s or 80s, and they, have, they come with the assumption that the surgery is the same and you know, they're very reluctant about certain things. And one of the discussions we have is about how things really have changed and how our understanding, again, with understanding the 3D anatomy of these deformities and how it really changes where we put the spine and how we're actually preparing them for adulthood, uh, how that impacts the patient in a positive way and how it's just not the same. It's just not the same. And we've got a lot of data and a, a lot of years of experience that show that. Um, but I don't think everybody knows that. No, it, there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to anything, and I, I always like to say, you're on the internet now, so I can't badmouth the internet, but there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. There's also a lot of information that's actually absolutely true, but has nothing to do with you. And then there's a very small amount of information that is 100% true, and it absolutely 100% relates to your condition. That information isn't easy to find, I'd like to think this video is one of those places, yeah. and uh, you know, also a bona fide websites like Scoliosis Research Society website, mm -hmm. different uh, national spine organizations. Uh, I think th those are tried and true ways to try and learn more about this disease. I should say sign. Yes, you know, that's uh, 
that's very well pointed, Tom. I think uh, both of us would say that we're the patient and family's number one advocate. And so with those questions, please just come to us. We, you know, there's nothing too simple or that y you can ask us, and we just want to be your resource and help you through this process. Well, we didn't provoke too many questions here today, but uh, I was happy. Uh, I'm ha glad you didn't ask me too many questions yeah. I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> I feel the same way. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, and thank you guys for tuning in. I hope that was helpful. Please reach out to us with any questions or concerns. Again, contact us if you have a child or family member or anyone who, you know, has these questions. Uh, we'd love to help. We'd love to assist in that. Uh, again, have a great day. Appreciate it.